Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show about books and the films based on them. Today's subject is the 1969 dark science fiction novel The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. Bit of backstory, a few months ago I was contacted by Penguin Random House, Crichton's publishing company, and offered a copy of the 50th anniversary edition of the book, and while I wouldn't usually deviate from the paid Patreon list, I realised this was my not to be passed up chance to make up for the Jurassic Park Lost in Adaptation from years and years ago where my dyslexic ass spent the entire episode calling him Michael Crichton. In case you're not familiar with him, Crichton was a hugely multi-talented gentleman, being a gifted screenwriter and film director in addition to writing books that sold in the millions, and often took a large role in adapting his own novels to the big screen. Not all of Crichton's books are the same, but the most popular ones tend to have a certain message at their core, namely, HUMANITY! DO NOT PLAY GOD WITH Blank. In Jurassic Park it was nature, in Prey it was artificial intelligence, and in The Andromeda Strain it's biology. Or possibly the unknowns of outer space, depending on how you look at it. A film adaptation followed very quickly in the book's footsteps in 1971. Unfortunately, it's not one of the projects that Crichton was directly involved in. The rights to the story were bought out by Universal, who hired Robert Wise to direct. To Universal's credit though, they also brought on Nelson Roosevelt Gidding, a man known for being very good at adapting books into film to write the screenplay, so this was evidently not intended to be a project devoid of respect for the source material. As usual, before getting into the adaptation, let's talk about the book and the film's individual merits and flaws. The Andromeda Strain was one of Crichton's early big hitters, almost instantly rocketing up all of the bestsellers lists. It's presented as a novelization of a recently declassified document. I was amused to read the fictional disclaimer saying that because all of the people involved in these events were often as stupid as they were brilliant, they would inevitably end up being offended by this retelling. I don't know how many of you will actually remember my Jurassic Park book review from way back when, but uh, in both of them, Crichton decided to illustrate his book with like very simple drawings or occasionally just present the information in his book in a different than usual way, you know, uh, mixing up the format a bit. Because of this, I was kind of curious to know what the audiobook would be like, so I downloaded the one off Audible and... I mean, you guys know that I'm usually super adamant that it is equally valid to read a paper book or an ebook or listen to an audiobook, but in this case, Crichton has kind of made it so you have to get a physical book to enjoy it the way he intended. For example, uh, there's a recreation of an audio log, and in the audiobook, the narrator has to read out the timestamp on every single frickin' line, and trust me, it got super old super fast. Getting back to a general review, um, interestingly, right, Crichton went out of his way to highlight something about each of the protagonists during their introduction that makes them a bit of an asshole. One of them has apparently gone through four wives, and two of them were married to his friends beforehand, and another is apparently a really hard man to work for because he's super anal about the way things have to be done, and ends up snapping at his underlings if everything doesn't go according to plan. Now, I like a flawed hero, it adds depth to the character, but it almost seemed like he wanted to make sure that I didn't like any of them too much. The Andromeda Strain isn't quite as polished as Jurassic Park, which really should surprise no one considering that 21 years of novel writing experience between them. Like a lot of Crichton's work, there's horror elements to it, but it's certainly not straight up horror. The War of the Worlds was often brought to my mind when I was reading this, mainly because of the deadly bacteria connection, though of course in this case it's flipped and humanity is being assaulted by an alien pathogen instead of aliens being brought down by earth viruses. A lot of this book is given over to describing scientific experiments. Now, don't get me wrong, I love science and science fiction, but I got the distinct impression, you know, just judging from the amount of time and enthusiasm that he poured into it, page after page that uh, Crichton really loved science, like, he really, really loved it. Thank you for calling the Naughty Science Appreciation Line, the premium phone line that satisfies all your confused feelings towards cutting-edge technology and scientific theories. For applied physics, press 1. For engineering, press 2. For cellular bio... The electron microscope was a magnificent tool I'd love to get my hands on. First developed in 1931, it uses a beam of accelerated electrons as a source of illumination. A quick word of warning before I move on to any film footage. I know some people can get quite upset at the idea of live animal experimentation, so I feel I should warn you that this film has some very realistic images of just that, so you might want to keep that in mind before watching this review. And this film is known for its unusual employment of the split screen. 
Whether you like this or hate it is up to you, but hey, at least they were trying something different. I super appreciate how much effort must have gone into this production. I try not to harp on about CG too much, as that's kind of every other internet critic's thing, but I have to confess, seeing a film that predates it and, as a result, has real helicopters, real sets, real mechanical arms, real animals, real babies, real towns with, well, realistic bodies littered around it is a nice change. An unfortunate downside of the film is the utterly obnoxious scoring and foley work. It's hard to describe, and unfortunately I can't play a clip of it because that's like a beacon for the copyright bots to swarm me, but for some reason they decided to inundate the film with semi-computerish whirring and buzzing noises, the Andromeda strain itself is represented by an alarming screeching noise, and the several scenes with a crying baby and that little bugger is drowning out the actors trying to talk. Middle-aged ass. Middle-aged ass, I hope you get a good look at this middle-aged man's ass. In 2008, a second adaptation took the form of a TV miniseries, but uh, it was crap, so let's talk adaptation about the film. Usually, upon getting these sorts of results from the Patreon survey, I would feel inclined to do a plot synopsis to bring everyone into the loop before starting the comparison, but this film is so freakishly accurate to the plot of the book, it renders that entirely superfluous, as this section would just be a word-for-word -word repetition of it. A satellite orbiting the planet getting knocked off course and crash landing not far from a very, very small town in Arizona. Slightly later, a pair of US Army soldiers following its signal to the town and finding everyone there dead except for a mysterious old man in white robes shortly before dying themselves. A spy plane making a flyover of the town and confirming that everyone is dead. The local officer in charge calling in the code word wildfire to the higher-ups. Wildfire turning out to be a contingency for dealing with the containment of a deadly virus or disease being brought to Earth from space. Once activated, five expert scientists and doctors are brought to a secret high-tech underground lab to figure out how to contain or cure the outbreak. In Doctors Stone, Levitt, Burton and Hall being grabbed by the military, but the fifth member, Dr. Kirk, being in a poorly timed hospital hospital stay for an operation. The scientists being informed that the satellite was part of Project Scoop, a data gathering mission that was collecting microscopic flecks of biological matter from the immediate space around planet Earth. Two team members making a hazmat suited visit to the town after dropping some bombs designed to kill the birds around it to stop the buzzards from spreading whatever it was that killed everyone. Discovering that almost everyone affected instantly collapsed without any funfair, but one or two mostly older people were driven mad instead and performed bizarre suicides. Eventually finding the space probe and two survivors survivors, an old man and a baby who are transferred to the wildfire base. Access to said base being through a secret elevator inside a tool shed in the middle of nowhere. The lab itself being five levels of high-tech machinery and isolation units, equipped with a supercomputer and a nuclear bomb that will automatically activate if there's a breach in containment. Wildfire also having super uptight decontamination procedures that go above and beyond all reason to completely sterilize and immunize its workers. Hall, a surgeon not entirely sure why he was brought onto the project, being informed that he is there partly because of a theory known as the odd man hypothesis that concluded from a range of simulations that only an unmarried man would consistently make the right choice when it came to the decision of whether or not to shut down the nuke once it was armed. The majority of the rest of the book and the film is a lot, and I mean a lot, of science. Experiments, simulations, discussions, you name it, they have it. Crichton's aforementioned, uh, appreciation for it is most definitely recreated in this film. Sprinkled in amongst this are other book accurate plot points like the president not having the balls to immediately order the infected town nuked despite the recommendation of the wildfire team, and the cutting edge communication equipment in the base breaking down because of a tiny scrap of paper that got caught up in the machinery. And Dr. Levitt choosing to not inform the team of their epilepsy, so having a fit at just the wrong moment, costing them valuable time in an emergency. The mysterious old man, who incidentally is called Peter Jackson, coming to and revealing that he has an ulcer problem that he's self-medicating for in a way that gives him extreme acid. This eventually leads them to discovering that infected people with massively imbalanced pH levels in their bodies will be spared death. The team eventually discovering that the satellite picked up a tiny piece of space debris that contained a substance entirely alien to Earth that's capable of reproducing and mutating in any environment and feeds on energy, leading them to realize that nuking it would have been a terrible thing after all, as it would have turned it into goodness knows what while simultaneously providing it with all the energy it needed to spread around the world instantly. The Andromeda strain mutating into a completely new organism that's harmless to 
humans but eats a certain type of plastic, causing an Air Force jet to partially dissolve and crash, and a containment breach within Wildfire, activating the nuke bomb countdown. Due to an incredibly stupid design oversight, the only guy with the ability to shut it off getting trapped on a level with no panel installed for him to insert his key into, forcing Dr. Hall to climb up a shaft filled with defense mechanisms designed to stop lab animals from escaping. Dr. H, despite tripping balls on tranquilizers, getting to the shut off just in time to stop the base from exploding. I was super happy and amused to see that the film included the super janky voice recognition software that frustrated all users, something of a clairvoyant prediction by Michael Crichton. In an interesting adaptation choice, the film follows the book's format of not strictly linear storytelling as well, flashing back to past events and forward to post in short bursts in a way that you don't often see in a visual storytelling format, unless that's like the whole gimmick, you know, like Lost or something. <laughs> Amazingly, I was only able to clock two even remotely important changes to the story. The first, the gender swapping of originally male Dr. Levitt, doesn't impact the plot in any way, but I'm still not 100% happy about it, to be completely honest. Usually, I would be super down with the choice to add some diversity to the Sausage Fest cast, but unfortunately, the film appears to have taken most of the negative character qualities that I mentioned were shared amongst the leads in the book and dumped them into the now token woman scientist. She spends all of her time complaining, shouting, and dragging her feet on every issue, so instead of representation of respected female scientists, we get a shrill grump the rest of the cast have to put up with and occasionally condescend to. The other big change is the ultimate fate of the Andromeda Strain. While both stories end with it mutating into something that doesn't directly kill humans anymore, in the film the wildfire scientists finish it off by figuring out how to use acid rain to completely neutralize it forever. In the book, no such thing happened. The written Andromeda Strain migrated into the upper atmosphere, spread out over the whole planet, and continued to to eat any plastic-like substance it came into contact with, causing the deaths of several American and Russian astronauts attempting to return to Earth. Basically, the book ends with humanity surrounded by a barrier preventing them from flying too high from now on, and all space exploration being put indefinitely on hold as a result. An arguably darker fate than the what if this happens again note the film left off on. Some of the next few things I usually wouldn't even bother mentioning, but it's pretty slim pickings in this section, and I like to make these videos at least 10 minutes long. Hall goes on the away mission with Stone instead of Burton, and when they meet Jackson, he briefly brandishes a knife at them. The film also plays him up as more of a creepy pervert than he was in the book. This leads to the other gender issue of the film, as the only other woman with any decent screen time is a nurse who finds it charming and amusing when old men grab her ass. I know this kind of behaviour isn't out of place in this time period, but it just irks me to see it added to a story that didn't have it before. In both versions of the story, it's revealed that the government was collecting space viruses to use in biological warfare. However, the film film handles said reveal with more dramatics. I got the impression that none of these scientists were even a little surprised to learn that the government was up to such shenanigans in the book, and for their part, the military adopted a, yeah, we're doing it, fuck you, it's the Cold War stance on the matter. You know when you hear a really bad joke, and you know it's not funny, but you laugh anyway and then kind of hate yourself? If we're eliminated, the aircraft and pilot will have to be sterilized. Oh, uh, wait a minute. That's not what they told me. Just incinerated. Again, there's a few things here and there, but legitimately not a lot worth mentioning. I got some serious house vibes from the book. They have a medical mystery to solve at high stakes and incorporate jargon in a way that's designed to let the PhD and MD lacking audience keep up with it. While I got some similar feelings from the film, they left out one thing in particular from the book that cemented the comparison for me. Namely, the classic random word used offhand that sparks a eureka moment. Damn it, we can't find any connection between the old man and the baby. Every experiment we try is so meaningless we might as well be wailing like the wretched child. Wailing? What if the wailing is what's keeping him alive? What? Crying causes rapid breathing, which can oxygenate your blood and cause a shift in your pH level. That's it! Alkaline! An acid! That's what stops Andromeda! Final thoughts. This film is as close to an exact recreation of the book as I've ever seen on this show, something that I have over time and experience come to realise isn't necessarily the best thing for an adaptation. I know this is Adaptation 101 and I've discussed these things many times before, but just in case there are any new beautiful watchers in the audience, films are shorter, there's a lot more emphasis on show don't tell, you can't just be told what the cast are thinking and feeling like you would in written form, and it's a lot more jarring if it's not told in a linear format. This film doesn't really account for any of these 
things and it suffers for it. Subjective complaint, but I think the over-reliance on scientific experiments to make up most of the story is even more obvious in the film as you can't skim read paragraphs of it and it drags a bit in places as a result. That said, there are of course some advantages to hyper-loyalty as well, namely the book was popular for a reason and at least some of those reasons are going to transfer over to the film. As I mentioned at the start, I super appreciate the colossal effort that must have gone into making this film and all its practical effects and even if I don't think it was entirely a good thing, the adaptation critic side of me can't help but be impressed by their extreme attention to detail when it came to recreating the book. If you enjoyed reading The Andromeda Strain and would like to see it, just all of it in film form, this adaptation will not disappoint. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Seeing as we're already talking about terrifying, unknowable things that change and mutate randomly and could spell doom for hundreds, please remember that the best way to help with the YouTube algorithm is to leave likes and comments and subscribing to channels you do not wish to be condemned by it. See you soon. As the wavelength of an electron can be up to a hundred thousand times shorter than that of visible light photons, electron microscopes have a higher resolving power than light microscopes and can reveal the structure of smaller objects. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Aaron G. Dunsill, Sasha I. Edwards, and Shelby Holtz. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that, I mean, I was going to, I found a magic lamp that granted me three wishes, and I meant to wish for infinite wealth, but, um, well, long story short, I have three jetpacks now. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Crying causes rapid breathing, which can often the day the blood. Between the old man and the baby, every Wailing. What if it's that's how we kill Andromeda! Good timing. Crying causes you to rapidly breathe, that's not the line. It causes a shift in your pH level, that's, that's a bad line. Crying. Damn it! I hope you didn't pick up the cat noises during that.